Welcome everyone. It is June the 11th and you are logging into the Deeper Insights webinar series from Tech Canada. My name is Ruth Ann Marley and I am part of the speaker division here at Tech Canada. It is my honor to welcome everyone logging in today. Um, you are looking at our lineup for from this week going into next week. So next week we have Amy K. Hutchins and she is a world-class uh, speaker, uh, keynote trainer, coach extraordinaire. She's going to be talking about leading and communicating in emerging times. This is an excellent session that I would encourage everyone to log in and bring your team along with you. On Thursday, we have an international sales expert. Jerome Ladal has been doing international video sales for the last 15 years across Europe and now here in Canada. So those of you who are now looking at sales in a video in, or virtual environment, I really encourage you to log in and hear Jerome. For our webinar today, I would ask you to put any questions or comments for our speaker into the question box. We'll make some time at the end of the presentation to uh, make sure we get all of that. This session will be recorded as well as I will ask Stefan to send us his uh, PowerPoint so that in a PDF so that you can look back and refer to some of the statistics that he's going to be speaking to. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Stefan Grenier. He is a nationally known mental health innovator. He's an advocate and a speaker as well as an entrepreneur. We were just talking before this about some wonderful new projects and initiatives that he's been uh, working on. He is retired from the Canadian military and he was retired at the uh, level of a lieutenant colonel after 29 years of service. He participated in several overseas missions, most notably nine months in Rwanda and six months in Kandahar. Numerous shorter deployments included Cambodia, Kuwait and the Arabian Gulf, Lebanon and Haiti just to name a few. So I just want to stop here and say thank you, Stefan, for your service. It is an honor. He also took personal interest in the way that Canadian forces were dealing with mental health issues. And so he coined the term operational stress injury or OSI to reframe perceptions about mental health. And in this time, he has conceived, developed and implemented as well as managed a national peer support program for the Canadian military and which now has a program in 57 offices with over 70 staff members. And I think some of this needs to be updated and he's gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Stefan Grenier. Welcome Stefan. Thank you very much uh, folks and uh, thank you for joining. Um, I've divided our time together today in three uh, um, segments. The first segment is um, sharing lessons uh, from the war zone, but more so regarding crisis. I mean, what what we're going through right now in 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 many people's lives is is a crisis, depending on on how how things are going for you, or your employees, or or the people you work with, or your family. So I'm going to focus on that lessons from the war zone. Uh, these lessons are not only my own lessons, but they are supported by the evidence. And uh, uh, this is more than my own views. It's a combination of what I've learned, uh, having been shipped off to many crisis zones in my life, uh, and how this um, sort of connects to our, our COVID situation right now and in the aftermath of this. The second segment, uh, another 20 some minutes, 25 minutes, it would be around workplace mental health. and providing you a different lens to uh, perceive workplace mental health challenges for employees and, 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 and people. Um, and that then goes into the last section, which is the thinking outside the box that we now need uh, to focus on in order to change the way humans are supported, especially from that workplace perspective. And I say this with all respect of the current systems, but if we if we look back to let's say last fall folks we will probably go back to a time pre-covid where workplace mental health 
was uh, on on a decline, and I'm talking about workplace mental health was on a decline, which means mental health challenges were increasing. So we know all the stats about this becoming uh, the most predominant uh, reason why employees struggle at work and, and, and things like that. So if that was the situation before the pandemic hit, what's it going to be like after? Predictions are not any better, likely worse. So the, this last piece is perhaps going to inspire you a little bit uh, about what you can be uh, thinking uh, for the future. And actually, our company, Mental Health Innovations, our entire focus right now is setting the stage for success in the post-pandemic era. A lot of our, um, a lot of organizations focusing on mental health during the pandemic, um, rightly so, jumped in and said, we're, we're going to help you uh, survive, you know, the, the crisis. Uh, we did not do that. Uh, we've been preparing for the post-COVID environment where that's where people are going to start hurting and you'll see in my lessons from the war zone how that fits so let's just dive into it from a lessons from the war zone perspective or uh what what, what can be learned um, through going through multiple crises and then working in the mental health space as i have in, in the last 20 years um, what have I learned about resilience, control, self-awareness, and this whole returning home or returning to normal? When we talk about the pandemic, it's, it's about returning to the normal or the new norm, as many people say. I understand that, uh, you know, tech brought uh, some other speakers that covered resilience, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that if any of you were to Google resilience and how do I become more resilient, you would be bombarded with all sorts of different recipes. Well, here's the recipe that our company has has endorsed, uh, not just because it's the recipe I endorse, but it is one that's fairly well researched and it probably connects well with other themes you've heard uh, so far. Uh, so I just want to get into the concept here of a crisis and what a pandemic and war have in common. And it's just, just to acknowledge the trajectory human beings have been on uh, since uh, late February, early March, depending on when uh, it really hit home that we were in, in this pandemic. So the first thing I will, I will say is that the trajectory between going to war and uh, being exposed to a pandemic is very similar. And the trajectory is, is articulated here. Uh, as you'll recall, the first month, probably the hardest period, right? Where um, everything is new, uh, there's so much change, you're not sure of where the threats are. And th these are really things that, that uh, connect well with, with me, uh, you know, arriving in, in Afghanistan or arriving in, in a war zone, you are dis disoriented. Uh, not sure uh, about what's next, uh, you have to adapt. And that that's the next piece here, the whole adaptation phase. But at one point you accept that new reality. Uh, and when you accept that new reality and you've adapted, you become productive. This is when you, you do your best work. This is when you're the most productive. Um, you've not only adapted to the new time zone, but you've adapted now to uh, the fact that there's longer lineups at the grocery store um, by between this time and this time. So you're more productive now. You you work around that and, and such and such. Um, and at one point, fatigue sets in. You know, um, the uh, it, and this is the cumulative wear and tear. I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, it's the cumulative wear and tear of of going through this grind, right? Of of every day having to be resilient, having to do things outside your comfort zone. And at one point, I'm not sure if there's a direct correlation here, but at one point, uh, you start becoming complacent. Uh, you perhaps become sloppy or take unnecessary risks. Now, uh, we, we've we all done that, I'm sure. You know, at, at first, I was a lot more rigorous when I came back from the grocery store with washing, you know, fruits and vegetables than, than I probably am now. Uh, I'm not saying I'm being sloppy, uh, but maybe it is being sloppy. So, it is a bit of a trajectory and why is that it's because i guess if we haven't been injured or killed or impacted directly by by the tragedy or the crisis uh we feel a certain a sense of invincibility and uh we start taking risks and we we want to just go back to normal a little bit um, now the bottom part here is what our company is focusing on is when this ends when the crisis ends uh, you know and and we go back to the new normal uh, normal is is likely um, different than what it was before. Um, 
and this is true, I believe, of of the pandemic, and it's definitely true when you when you come back from from war. Not because you may have been impacted, but the crisis has changed you. It changed other people. Um, and what we're looking uh, at right now, and what I believe organizations need to really pay attention to, is that cumulative wear and tear on people, uh, and that many people will struggle many months after they've returned to the new norm. Uh, and some may get help, most won't get help and fall through the cracks. So things to think about. Now, resilience. Um, this, this, this model here is, is not only anchored in, in what I think worked for me, what worked for my colleagues, but is anchored in two significant pieces of research. Uh, and the references are at the bottom here. Now, I will share with you that uh, I've put this into practice now for several years. Um, I started probably during one of my last tours of duty in, in Afghanistan. And um, really, this is the time to be resilient uh, during, during a crisis. Essentially, resilience to me, to, to Seligman and, and Rachel Thibault, Dr. Thibault, is not uh, something that you do, um, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a way of life. And so essentially, uh, there's, two, there's two things uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and of course, this is, a, this is a webinar, it's not a course, uh, and it's a speed dating to introduce you to these concepts. So according to Seligman and, and Thibault and, and, and the gang and, and me, uh, the first thing we need to do is, is drop those junk activities or, or, or abandon those junk attitudes. Uh, essentially, and, and we see that around us, right? A sense of entitlement would be a uh, junk attitude or, or sense of victimhood. Uh, the fact that we don't accept responsibility for ourselves, uh, that we blame others, uh, that we're addicted to drama. These are all things that we need to be very weary of. And you'll see, uh, I mean, addiction to drama, you can probably, um, see in your network of people uh, uh, some that are are more on social media and and they focus on all that negative stuff. Uh, well, that may not be an addiction to drama, but it is uh, in that zone of of junk attitudes. So the m number one thing is be aware that there are things called junk attitudes or junk activities, and you need to drop those. That's step number one. Step number two is um, you need to adopt. Um, uh, an attitude where uh, you are able to judge less, um, be be grateful, um, turn the page when when things are, are done, act in moderation and balance, and when you can actually set something right, correct that. Uh, and the example I often give for this is, you know, if you walk out in in, in the middle of winter and you slip on the sidewalk and you fall on your back. Uh, you know, the junk attitudes would be, oh, darn city, you know, they didn't clear the sidewalks. Why does this always happen to me? And so, of course, those are the some of the patterns we we often endorse, right? But what if you, you, you had a bit of compassion for other people? Oh, my God. Gratitude mm -hmm. for the fact that you, you haven't broken your back. Uh, you move on beyond blaming the city mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in, in, a, in a spirit of justice and moderation. You say, well, what can I do about this? Well, you go back to the garage, put a bit of salt on that patch of ice on the sidewalk, and you move on with your day. Those actions actually allow you to be more resilient uh, in the face of that, uh, th that uh, incident. Now, in the middle of a day when it's really going bad uh, or a week and you need to, to become more resilient, you're, you're having a hard time focusing on those key steps. The how is so easy, so important. Uh, it's almost, uh, it's, it's, it's almost uh, unimaginable that all you need to do is create a moment of silence and solitude for yourself, uh, a five minute, six, six, seven minutes, um, sit on the couch, stare at the wall for a few minutes, um, try it. Uh, rebooting the brain is essential. And when you, when you can bring yourself down and often, often I say, we've heard all of that before when we were young, growing up, uh, an old uncle or somebody or an old aunt said to us, you know, count to 10, sleep on it, uh, things like that. When, when you count to 10, you are actually rebooting your brain. So essentially, that's uh, the recipe on resilience. And again, I recognize this is speed dating uh, on, on a bunch of concepts, uh, but things 
to think about as we continue to go through the crisis. Now, with regards to control, and, and remember that all this is leading to paradigm shifts around the workplace and then some solutions that you should consider. Now, when we talk about control, now during a crisis, um, and again, what I've learned overseas uh, in, in, in war zones and, and, and different areas, is control is something that uh, rapidly uh, evaporates when a crisis situation occurs. And essentially, uh, We've again, we've all heard these these things that um, you know uh, let go of the things you can't control and, um, and and focus on the things you can control. Well, essentially, this is simply uh, bringing that concept back up in the context of of COVID, uh, of the crisis, or any other crisis uh, inside your workplace. And as leaders, as as members of organizations, I think it's incumbent upon us to endorse these sort of ways of thinking in order to lead our people and, and uh, actually lead by example and, and such. So essentially the concept here is in a crisis, we, we live our lives and we, we try to you know not let things we can't control bother us. When we get into a crisis, we tend to forget about those things because we are disoriented and all of a sudden everything is hitting us and therefore reminding ourselves, and I guess this is what I'm doing today, that we really need to make a triage. We need to make a list. And for those who have a harder time, make the list. Uh, this could work for your employees, it could work for you, it could work for, for your family members, your teenage uh, teenage kids or, or whatnot. Making a list, especially when fear starts to take over. And so um, here's two, two, two buckets, I guess, of things that I can control versus things I can't control uh, and actually let go and focus on those things you can control. Again, this is very, very basic, very simple perhaps, but sometimes we need to be reminded. Along with the issue of control, folks, is when you're going through a crisis, and this applies perhaps now, crisis is sort of uh, almost over or hopefully, uh, but there will be more. Uh, whether in your organization or whatnot, uh, or, or, or in, in the country. And so when you go through a crisis, one of the concepts that's very important uh, to focus on is understanding which zone we want to go be in for the duration of the crisis. And uh, the longer you are in what uh, is called the fear zone, well, the more difficult it is for you to maintain well mental wellness be resilient because you're really in, in that zone of fear. And so graduating uh, from that zone to the learning zone to the growth zone is key. Now, again, this is speed dating on the concept. Uh, there are ways to actually motivate oneself to move from these various zones. And you can see in, in the, uh, the bullets uh, what 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 people are like, what behaviors uh, are associated with each of these zones. And clearly, you can see uh, that we all want to thrive to be in that growth zone. We all want to make sure that the, the, the crisis is not driving our life, that our life is no longer on hold. Uh, we are able to uh, feel uh, grateful and appreciate what we have. And, and again, mm -hmm. that concept here goes back to the concept of resilience. Uh, and uh, again, paying it forward, thinking of others, not being self-centered like you were or like other people are in, in the fear zone. Very, very important. And again, connects back to some principles around resiliency. And so all this to say, uh, when we get into a crisis, it's normal to spend an hour, a minute, uh, a week, uh, some time in that fear zone. But knowing that there are other zones to be in and regardless of the crisis carrying on you can be in that growth zone um, i spent uh, close to 11 months in rwanda during the genocide and after and i i remember clearly uh when uh you know very disoriented when i got there it was the civil war was raging I wasn't fearful necessarily, but the way I behaved was would, would be categorized as the fear zone. But I remember later in my tour, it was definitely in the growth zone and uh, and did things that manifest itself only if you can be in that growth zone. And I talk about that in, in the book. 
not that I, I talk about stories aligning with this particular model. But when I look back, I'm thinking, oh, look at that. At this stage, I was obviously in the growth zone. Of course, I didn't know that in 1994. Uh, but now that I know this, I can see myself with the clarity of hindsight moving through. Now that we know this, I think it's important for leaders to know that you can coach your people to go from zone to zone to zone and be more productive. The, 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 the next concept here is the concept around self-awareness. Now, when we drive our car, when you're going through a crisis, uh, you can't just go through the crisis being unaware of what's going on with yourself or unaware of what's going on with your people. You have to uh, know what's going on. From a mental health perspective, we often hear the, the, the saying, well, mental health is so difficult, so challenging because we don't see mental health problems. Well, I challenge that. We can see mental health problems, folks. And if you spend the time with us at MHI, you'll, 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 you'll clearly see mental health problems. Uh, in, in those around you, in yourself, and challenges, and then you'll you'll know how to fix them or how to support people. So this image here is a reminder that when we hop in our cars and we take a drive to the grocery store or uh, on a vacation, that there's a lot of signs that, um, and there's a, there's a lot of awareness, in fact, uh, around what's going on with our car. Is our fuel tank full? Uh, is our battery charge? Um, what's the temperature of the oil? Is our seat belt on? Uh, and so we we drive a car fully aware of what's going on. Do we drive our lives that way from a mental health perspective? Most don't. And I'm here to tell you that that can change. Uh, so we uh, this is a model that I, I developed when I was at National Defense. I've evolved it since. Uh, my company uses it now when we when we teach mental health to people and in, in all of our training uh, programs, this model is the lens through which we can observe people and, and see, oh my God, this person is in the yellow zone or orange zone or red zone or whatnot. And then we can adapt our behaviors and we, we, we can actually um, uh, adapt how we support these people. And by the way, this applies to yourself. It applies to oneself as well. So as a person goes through a crisis, they need to check in with themselves through what lens through this lens here and so uh, very rapidly this model is the mental health equivalent of what we don't need to be taught physical injuries don't need to be taught to people you feel those right um, and so I, I we don't need to tell anybody this is what a sprained ankle feels like if you sprain an ankle you pretty much know i didn't hear a snap uh it, it, I can walk on it. If you break that tibia bone in two, you know. You don't need to be taught those things. Of course, I'm not talking about doctors now. I'm talking about as we live our lives. So the healthy reacting injured ill zone in the mental health space is pretty much equivalent to my ankle is fine. Uh, you sprain your ankle, reacting zone. You break a leg, injured zone. Uh, Stefan was in Afghanistan. He stepped on a landmine and he lost his foot. Right. And so from a mental health perspective now, that reacting injured ill in the way we train people to see, observe, react to support others, depending on where they're at on this continuum, allows us to actually do something about mental health. And it allows us no longer to ignore mental health problems around us because we can now see them. Now, all this manifests itself in either symptoms, but that's mainly for doctors, but mainly behaviors. Workplaces, what we say at MHI is it's immaterial what the symptoms are. It's mostly those behaviors, and I'm gonna get into that in a few seconds with the barometer um, uh, narrative uh, in a few seconds. So know that uh, this continuum exists. We actually, I'll present to you an e-learning campaign at the end of this webinar. I'll introduce you to it. Uh, that actually uses this model and does a deeper dive. And it's an e-learning campaign, so you don't have to be packed in a classroom to, to learn about it. Uh, but I think this is instrumental in understanding about ourselves, understanding about the people around us, and that they might be struggling. Now, returning to normal or the new norm, things to, 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 to keep in the back of your mind as we re-enter the new norm, uh, a crisis situation changes people, it changes you. Uh, nobody is going to be exactly the same. 
that doesn't mean everybody's going to be mentally ill. Absolutely not. But a crisis changes you. And these are some uh, things to keep in mind, especially for those leading organizations. Um, and I always worry about those people who will not be well and who might not even know it because they don't have that self-awareness. Um, and one thing they also keep in mind is that when you start struggling from a mental health problem, um, a lot of people say, well, you know, people don't go for care. They, 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 they don't even know their, well, of course not. The very part of the human anatomy that can tell you that you're not well is unwell. It's the brain. So at the end of the day, believes in the support around employees, the support in organization is so key. It's not that we want to create an environment where an employee taps on the shoulder of another employee and says, hey, I think you're mentally ill. Absolutely not. But sometimes you need somebody to start engaging in that conversation and preventing something small from becoming bigger. And again, I'm pointing to our We Care e-learning campaign. I'll get into that a little later. But what if everybody had that knowledge? Wouldn't that be cool? Now, when, when things go back to normal, I, I make the comparison that we need to sort of take out our barometer, either for ourselves, the people we love around us, or our employees. And the barometer is simply a comparison. Like the barometer doesn't tell you what the temperature is. It tells you that change is, is occurring. And essentially, an, another tip I would give everyone, if you want to know if somebody's struggling or going through a, a mental health challenge of some sort, look at change. Now, change, what, what kind of changes? Well, I put a few things here on the screen, but it could be about 300 other behaviors, right? I just put a few here to get your creative thinking going. So if somebody, as an example, was a very social butterfly at work, and all of a sudden they've become an introvert, that's change. If somebody was extremely re reliable and showed up at eight o'clock every morning, and all of a sudden they're late all the time, that's change. If somebody was uh, had their you know cubicle or their office very tidy or their workspace very tidy and all of a sudden that's change. I'm not saying that if change occurs, the person has a mental health problem or is mentally ill. No, but it's something to be aware of. If we're not aware of those things, how can we have a conversation with or how can we say, I'm going to pay attention to Bob here a little bit. I've noticed that he doesn't come to the lunchroom anymore. He he swears more than, more, than normal. Um, He's always late, uh, and uh, you know is is so those are so keep an eye out and maybe go for coffee with Bob and, and engage in conversation. So again, the barometer of change. The last thing I'll talk about here before we go to the other segment, which is the paradigm shift around mental ill health in the workplace, is the concept that when we go through a crisis, we adopt certain things that we need to do to survive or go through the crisis. So what I'm acknowledging here in the first arrow is that what worked before for you or for employees uh, to maintain their resilience, uh, uh, their level of their mood, uh, their level of wellness, et cetera, et cetera, whatever worked for you before the crisis may not work during the crisis. More importantly, during the crisis, uh, we adopt a certain way of, of functioning in order to go through the crisis, depending, and by the way, the pandemic is not, it's a crisis for everyone, but it's its not at the same level of intensity. Certainly uh, for me and my colleagues, we've been working in the virtual workplace for eight years now. So when we had to go to the virtual workplace, it was absolutely no change. So we did not live that crisis. Many larger workplaces felt the punch when all their employees, thousands of employees had to work at home all of a sudden. So that was very disorienting. So depending, but the fact of the matter is when you go through a crisis, if you're in a crisis, you'll have to pivot your strategies a little bit. And, and my recipe is spend 50% of your energy focusing on being resilient, look after yourself uh, and be self-aware. And if you start to decompensate, reach out for help. Uh, that's the proportion of, of the energy you, you expend to get through the crisis. A lot of people confuse self-care and resiliency. Now, the two go hand in glove, 
But if for your own self-care, you, I don't know, you walk your dog, you love to read, you eat a healthy diet, and uh, you do yoga, those are all great things that you're doing to, to look after yourself, mind, body, and soul. But resilience has nothing to do with that. Resilience is all about that way of life that you you really need to endorse to actually face, get through the crisis, and not be negatively impacted, right? And we talked about resiliency a little bit. Now, the two are, are great concepts, but they are different, right? Which is why after the, the crisis is over, of course, you don't stop being resilient, but you now need to focus a little more on self-care and self-awareness. Why? Because there's a chance that the crisis has impacted you, and it's basically the time to lick those wounds, right? And, and look after yourself a little more. While during the within post recently, sometimes you just got to put those boots on and get the job done. So essentially, be aware that what worked before, during, and after need to pivot a crisis. So we're going to get into, uh, is everything going well, um, uh, Ruth Ann? Uh, I'm just going here full speed ahead. I see 53 participants. Just a quick check in there to see if uh, everything is going good at your end. Okay, so I didn't hear anything. I'm going to assume that I'm still good to go. Yeah, Stefan, uh, you're good to go. Oh, okay, sorry, okay, great. Uh, so paradigm shifting now. So what, what I wanna do now is just do a, a quick paradigm check and a shift. Now, some of you, this may not be a paradigm shift, but I wanna challenge a little bit of our views regarding workplace, mental health, um, and challenge some of the, uh, the perspectives out there. And the reason I say I wanna challenge this a little bit is because we mainly see mental health challenges from the clinical lens. And as the title of my presentation said, is it a clinical matter or a leadership matter? So if you ask me, mental health in the workplace is not a clinical issue at all. It's a leadership issue. It's an organizational leadership issue. If somebody needs treatment, that's a clinical issue. But workplaces and mental health is not a clinical issue. Doctors, clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists have been trained to actually treat people. Uh, leaders, hopefully, have been trained to lead people, lead organizations to success. And part of that is supporting people. If your people develop a mental illness, they need to go get help. Uh, they need to be treated, perhaps. But when they're at work, that healthy uh, being is, is definitely impacted uh, in, in the way they're supported or not. So if, if, you know, if we remember back in our days of, uh, of pre-COVID, when we used to drive to work um, and we bumped into people, um, you know, people know each other, they, they, uh, they say good morning to each other. And when they do that, they're acknowledging each other, but rare are the situations where an employee will say, good morning, uh, Bill, how are you? And Bill will say, well, let me tell you, right? In the elevator lobby, this is going bad. I don't know what's going on with me. I can't concentrate anymore. I think I think my wife and I are getting a divorce. Uh, my, my boss, I can't stand my boss. You're normally not going to hear that, of course. Be why? Because people don't share, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. The workplace is not a, a pity party after all. And so we normally say, oh, good. You know, we normally, despite what's really going on, we normally acknowledge by saying, yeah, I'm good. How are you? And the elevator opens, and we get in the elevator, and we go to work. And so what we what we talk about normally is what i call socially acceptable things right not in 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 the sense that it's 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 uh, it's rude or but from a mental health perspective people will share their little trials and tribulations from what is felt as the socially acceptable things to share. In other words, if my father passes away, I might acknowledge that. You know, how you doing, Stefan? Oh, I, well, not, not too good. My, my father passed away. Like, oh my God, I didn't know. And you, you'll have kind of conversations about these things. But what if Stefan is depressed, clinically depressed, uh, and is in treatment? Rare are the situations where somebody will say, how are you, Stefan? They say, oh, I just got diagnosed with clinical depression and I'm taking Pristic uh, as, as medication and I'm doing uh, therapy. You normally don't hear those things in the workplace. So this is to say that we rarely have conversations between human beings in the workplace in what I call the zone, the seven to 10 zone. This is where somebody is kind of 
really unwell. And I remember, you know, for, for, for you, I don't know what it would be for you, but for me, I remember clearly after coming back from Rwanda, I was not well at all, uh, but I kept going to work. I was sort of the, a walking wounded in my workplace. And uh, I here I am in, in the National Defense Operations Center one morning, and um, at around 10 o'clock in the morning, I for some reason, I teared up. I started crying in the workplace. And here I am in uniform with my rank and my medals on my chest. And I, you know, so of course I went to the bathroom, um, spent around 10 minutes there, five, five, 10 minutes figuring out what was going on and, um, you know, put cold water in my face, wiped my face, went back to the workplace. And when I went back in, uh, Mike Arsenault, who saw me said, hey, Stefan, we need to, where were you? Oh my God, what's going on? Cause he saw that I was, and of course I blamed allergies. There was no way I would tell Mike how I was really feeling. And I, actually, I was confused. I didn't know what was going on with me. And so we rarely engage in that seven to 10 zone. Uh, but I see that as a bit part of the problem. Now, we don't want to turn workplaces into pity parties where we, we spend all day sharing with each other how we're doing. But the fact that we can't be authentic um, is part of the problem. And the, 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 the difficulty with this is that, you know, Where's the sweet spot of allowing people to be human at work, acknowledge that they're going through a rough time and not drop productivity or not, 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 not everybody, it's, it's a zoo now. Everybody's chit-chatting all day about how they're doing. No, there, there is a sweet spot to achieve. But we need to recognize that in many workplaces, the seven to 10 zone is rarely talked about. And so what workplaces for the most part have uh, in place now and this is what I'm, I'm here to challenge a little bit with you guys, uh, is EAP and, uh, you know, a good benefit plan probably where your employees, if they need sleeping pills or antidepressants, 80% uh, of them are covered. So we've, we've reduced the barriers to accessing professional care. Uh, we've reduced the financial barriers to obtain uh, any medication you may need uh, to support uh, your, you go through uh, a challenge. Uh, but this is like having a two-legged stool, really. Now, I make the comparison of a two-legged stool um, because we'd never buy a two-legged stool to, uh, to sit on. Uh, not something that anybody would ever buy, but this is what most workplaces have, folks, when it comes to supporting people's mental health. And what uh, I, I think is important to acknowledge is that we also focus a lot on things uh, that uh, we've, we're comfortable with. Essentially, when it comes to workplace mental health, you know, we, uh, and sorry, my power just went out. I'm glad I have a, a, a rechargeable router and Wi-Fi access and uh, my laptop is fully charged. That's why I'm so dark all of a sudden. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we seem to uh, be at a stage where we say, well, we got an EAP, we got good benefit plan for employees. And, you know, we have little lunch and learns every once in a while where we remind people, you know, uh, basics of, of, uh, of health and wellness is eat a healthy diet, drink lots of water, exercise regularly, sleep eight hours a night. And, and if, if something goes wrong, call your EAP. And we, we use these buzzwords like work-life balance and things like that. And I'm thinking... I know that that's not enough, right? That, that that may be good if you're if you're a little bit stressed, but if your mental health is is decompensating, this doesn't cut it. And we are we are literally seeing how it's not cutting it with the long-term disability benefits skyrocketing in Canada and mental health challenges becoming the most significant reason why people go on disability leave and, and, and such and such. I remember when I started working uh, 20 years ago in the mental health space, we talked about 2020. I remember about 10 years ago, uh, the economic roundtable on mental health was predicting by 2020, mental health challenges will surpass cardiovascular disease. And here we are, it's 2020, uh, and we have surpassed cardiovascular disease. So literally, folks, um, we need to change things up, and we really need to pay attention to things that we instinctively know are important, but that we have never really paid attention to organizationally. So I'm here to tell you a few things. I'll present to you this, this evidence. Um, uh, it's a piece of study. This is tw a 20-year-old piece of research uh, done by Chris Bruin, uh, 
psychologist in, in the UK who looked at the risk factors to predict who is more at risk in developing a mental health challenge than another person. And this is not unlike physical uh, health problems. As you know, uh, there's all sorts of risk factors that doctors use to determine your own uh, risk of developing cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, lung problems, and things of that nature. Uh, mental ill health is no different. And when we look at the risk factors for mental health challenges or mental illness, um, <clears throat> some of them are on this slide. Dr. Don Richardson put this slide together for me uh, many years ago uh, because, you know, he kept sending me the the research piece and I would read it and I'm thinking, Don, Don he's a psychiatrist, researcher. I said, give me a slide. So he put this slide together for me here. And um, and of course, not all of the risk factors are articulated on the slides, but the most predominant ones are. And some of them are obvious. If somebody is abused when they're a child, well, one would logically conclude that they're probably slightly more at risk than somebody who was not abused as a child of developing mental health challenges later on in life. And psychiatric history is, is the same, other traumas. If you go through a trauma, the trauma severity, of course, it's a risk factor. So the bigger the trauma, the bigger the risk. But look at the one risk factor on the far right, the lack of social support. This is something we've known, in fact, for a long time. We've known this. I've known this for 20 years. I've been working now in this space for 20 years. And while we know that those who are supported will fare better than others, we now know that the lack of social support is a risk factor. It essentially is an accelerant to decompensating from a mental health uh, perspective. Therefore, I'm, I'm here to tell you that if there's one thing organizations and leaders need to really pay attention to moving forward, especially, and I, I hate to hinge the need on the COVID pandemic, but it is what it is. We, we are at the tail end of a pandemic. Hopefully we won't hit another wave, but this is impacting people. Um, so let's acknowledge that. But regardless, I'm here to tell you that if you want to change things up and you want to see those disability rates drop and productivity go up and all this, and you have it all, focus on social support. And if you focus on that, you will turn things around. Now, what is social support? Uh, we'll get into that very rapidly towards the end of the webinar. Now, the reason why focusing on that is so important is because focusing only on clinical services and ensuring that people can access therapy and see a doctor and access medication is that remember that when these people are in care, they're not in a hospital bed every day receiving intravenous mental health care. They're literally consuming an hour every couple of weeks. And essentially, they're left alone between those medical appointments without social support embedded to look after those social support needs between medical appointments, you have a two-legged stool. And so creating the third leg of that stool is actually to cover the gap left behind between medical appointments. That is not intentional, but we can no longer rely on the Good Samaritan to look after the social support needs of people now that we know it's such an important risk factor. So I'm here to tell you that that third leg of the stool is right around the corner. It's a matter of deciding whether or not uh, to actually do, implement, create, manage, oversee that social support in the form of workplace peer support programs. Now, the last part of, of uh, what I wanna talk to you about today is thinking outside the box. So this is the last little segment here to sort of create that innovative change uh, and see what you guys, uh, what leaders wanna do next uh, to support their organizations and, and move uh, into, into the future. So the first thing I'm, I'm gonna share with you here is uh, you really need to rethink mental health training. I, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know it all, but I, I've been at this 20 years and I know for sure that some formulas work and some formulas don't work. And uh, one thing uh, that we don't do, one thing that we do not endorse is assuming that people don't have the skills. Uh, people have the skills and you're gonna say, well, why is the big, what's the big deal? The big deal is this, is you, first of all, you can't approach adult education as if they're a bunch of children. 
uh, you have to respect where people are. And when you come in a classroom or uh, a webinar and uh, you, you assume people have no skills and you're there to teach them, that power differential, that whole approach will backfire from an adult education perspective. What we like to do is remind them that the same skills they use to support their neighbors at home or their friends, closest friends, or their family people, those skills can actually be imported into the workplace. And we're here to sort of transition that skill because it needs to be done slightly differently, uh, but this, the, the competency is transportable. Um, I also think that uh, you need to identify the areas of greatest concern in your workplace. In other words, you need to custom design um, some of the training. I think buying off the shelf, cookie cutter approach uh, is not, probably not the best way to go about things. And so for each of our training approaches, we actually engage the workforce and we figure out what we're gonna focus on. Um, one of the uh, key teachables for us is interpersonal relationships between managers and employees is key and it has to be developed well ahead of the mental health problem developing for that employee. You know, managers approach me every once in a while and say, I have this employee, you know, I want to know how to support him. And, and quickly I realized there was no relationship before. So how can there be a relationship now? In other words, it's too late to teach somebody how to swim when they're drowning. You have to teach them how to swim before. So that relationship is that swimming skill. If that swimming skill isn't there, it's too late. Um, that human-centric culture, uh, abandoning the clinical narrative. The warning I would have for you is any curriculum that is heavily loaded with clinical narrative like symptoms, uh, words like, like depression, bipolar, PTSD, um, schizophrenia, and all the clinical diagnosis, that's a red flag to me. So when you choose a, a training approach, uh, endorse those who look at lived experience, looks at uh, challenges, problems, you know, as opposed to, uh, let me tell you the difference between bipolar and depression. That's important to a psychiatrist. It's important to somebody who's going to prescribe the right dose of medication. Those differences and those nuances are pretty much uh, irrelevant when it comes to workplaces and how to support somebody. The methodology to support is the same. Um, I also uh, encourage all of you to not only train managers. So many organizations only train managers on how to deal with this, these issues, and their employees are left behind. That's a problem. If you're going to change the game or the rules of the game, you can't change the rules just for some people. And I know that education is not rules, but essentially, if you increase the mental health literacy of managers, the employees are left behind and they don't know what the managers know. So those conversations are going to be miscalibrated. So it's the entire workforce. Uh, and the last point here I'll touch on on my last slide coming up in two minutes. Uh, it's, it's relationship between people is a lot more important than solutions and words. And I'll get to that in a few seconds here. Uh, I'm here to tell you that, you know, after what, a decade or, or decade and a half of, of Bell Let's Talk and all this, I think it's time to walk the talk. And I was saying this way before the pandemic. Um, this is not a new narrative for me, although you may not have heard me say this before. There are very tangible ways you as leaders, organizations can actually walk the talk and create meaningful ways to support their people and empower change in the organization. Uh, and um, that's kind of what we do at MHI. That's, that's our focus. Um, I want to introduce you to uh, two things that we're really excited about, and that uh, whether you, uh, you, you, you follow our whole training uh, advice or not, um, we have uh, been looking for uh, an e-learning uh, opportunity for many, many years now, recognizing that packing people in the classroom is kind of becoming a thing of the past. The pandemic has certainly accelerated that. We had started down this path um, back in December, uh, not knowing the pandemic was around, but it is very serendipitous for us to be deploying uh, our We Care program. We've partnered with an Australian organization and we've become the North American distributors of a very pragmatic, simple, affordable way 
of empowering people to do um, what we would all do. Imagine, imagine a, a, an employee walking into the workplace one morning with uh, crutches and a cast and, and somebody just behind them. Would the person behind them not reach over and open the door for the person with a cast? Absolutely, they would. You don't need training for that. Sadly, that's not happening right now for mental health problems. What if we can change that? So this We Care e-learning campaign is the first step in actually achieving this, uh, in allowing a human being to actually open, figuratively open the mental health door to somebody who's going through a challenge. So uh, if you want to know more, uh, give us give us a ping. Uh, I know Ruth Ann has uh, our contact information. And uh, we're asking you to crowdsource that human benevolence that you have in your workplace. Empower people with very small micro skills so they can actually care for others in a very meaningful way that's going to change people's lives. Um, the other innovation that we're launching now is that we've been in the business of peer support, workplace peer support for, I've been in the business for 20 years. My company has been in the business of this for 10 years. Uh, we're very proud to say that Health Canada has just, uh, is our latest client and they've bought our brand new program, which includes a mobile device application uh, to connect people, connect a, a, an employee uh, who is qualified and trained to support others around challenges and things of that nature with somebody who who's who is struggling and now we're bringing our service after 20 years now into uh the technology space um, through a mobile device application and and we're launching this fall with health canada as our first workplace client and others are following so we're putting in the hands of of workers of employees a program that used to be very much analog not that there's any problem with analog but we're now connecting people, have the ability to connect people like never before. And I think for the uh, younger people, um, what I've learned is if it's not in the phone, if it's not in the smartphone, it doesn't exist. So we've um, we've leaned in and embraced technology, and we're there. Uh, finally, here's here's the here's the end. I'll 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 tell you this. If you want to know what you need to do to support somebody who is going through a hard time, I'll tell you, it's as simple as this. It's not the words that you use. It's not the solution you point to. It's not the 1-800 number you give the person. It's your time. It's the connection that is created between you and the person you're helping. Your acknowledgement that you have no idea how to fix this, but you're there for them, and you're going to support them through this and you're going to work with them to find solutions. And so often people are wondering, what can I say to make it better? It's not what you say, it's how you are, how you be. And if you be, if you are with the person and you support them, that's more than half the battle. And um, if you want to Google this a little more, Google Brene Brown, empathy. Very quick uh, YouTube video, Brene Brown. Some of you might know her. She's extremely popular, more popular than me. Uh, but remember that. So tomorrow, if you bump into somebody who's going through a hard time, know that you don't need to come up with a magical solution. And um, I wanted to end uh, today's webinar on that one. As you can appreciate, I didn't uh, cover a lot of war stories. Uh, did write a book. The book is available. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, but I did not want to make these webinars or my keynotes in North America uh, about my war stories. Uh, and on that note, um, I'm ready for questions, Ruthann. Thank you, Stefan. Sorry, we had a landscaping crew arrive next door and my floor managers had to go and deal with that in a very loud barking manner. So <laughs> I <fine>. apologize. That's <laughs> okay. I had to step away for a moment. And I um, ran out of power, as you can see. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know what? We are adapting and moving through in yeah. our environment right now. That's right. Um, a few questions, and, I, and I'm wondering if you could go back to the slide that, that talks, uh, that is all about the spectrum of uh, going through, you know, the hurting, the, the, the scale. Because for some people, um, I first came, yeah, that was, that, that's the one there. 
I first came in contact with that at the university when I was there because we were all probably part of your program in talking about this. So can you give us, I know that there's a little bit more detail that you expand on in, in the individual programs, but we've had a few questions that have come in that are specific, but I, I don't want to go into specifics. I want you to kind of say, could you give examples about recognizing an employee that might be in one of those zones or yourself, because sometimes we can't see ourselves, but usually we can see someone else. So could you give us a couple of examples of a reacting behavior, an injured behavior to the furthest extent of the actual illness? Absolutely, I'll give you an example of somebody very real in my life, my past, my past workplace life, where, um, and I will call the person Bob, generic Bob, okay? Because his name was not Bob, but I'll call him generic Bob. So this is a real employee, and over a five-month period, his con his situation, I don't want to call it a condition because I'm not a doctor, the condition or the situation went from this to that. This being happy-go-lucky employee coming in the morning, uh, smiling, uh, bumping to and he was working for uh, one of my managers right so and i i'm i was very personable and i would talk to everyone no power differential i was that kind of a boss i still am right and so when i would bump into bob in the cafeteria he would turn around and say hi steph how are you you know and uh, it's a good good how are you i had a good weekend that kind of that kind of behavior right uh, moving forward all of a sudden that behavior in the cafeteria stops and of course in hindsight now it's very clear but at the time i'm thinking oh you know bob is not not himself today but so what i mean we all have bad days right from that to uh you know spending a lot more hours in the cubicle it was a cubicle farm at the time and uh as, as opposed to he would go around every once in a while and stop at people's cubicle and have little chit chats there often work related but you know how it is right it goes from work related to a bit of social back to work and then back to the cubicle doing doing whatever bob would do and that disappears right and uh in meetings what we started noticing is that he was not having eye any eye contact anymore he was always uh fiddling around on post-it notes and, and his little thing and um that went uh, you know when i look back in hindsight to actually reacting in meetings, right? To say, well, here we go again, right? Or I can't believe they did this again. Or really endorsing that sense of victimhood, uh, sense of drama a little bit, but not in a flippant way, but it was a bit out of character, but it wasn't like glaringly, and we're all entitled to having our opinions, but his opinions were, you know, 99% of the time negative uh, and, uh, a little loud and those those opinions got louder and louder uh altercations with people started right where he had a few um loud words with people over cubicle walls now not even realizing that this is not the place to have an argument right uh to one day kicking a garbage can halfway down the hallway of the of the cubicle farm right where he sort of lost it kicks the garbage can and scares people. Now he's in the injured stage, as far as I'm concerned on this continuum. The reacting stage was, the early days was probably fidgeting a lot in, in, in the boardroom. Uh, later stages were being very negative and, uh, and going into having that argument, still reacting, but starting to be dark yellow, light orange. But the day that garbage can got kicked was really the day. Uh, and then, of course, he went on sick leave after that, right? So became ill, we'll say ill for, for this part. Dislocation from, from the workplace, essentially. Now, this is a story that doesn't end necessarily well because this person came back to the workplace but never went back to the healthy zone. For some reason, he, he I, I don't know, this has been a long time now, he's probably in the reacting zone very disenfranchised at the time I was there anyways, uh, very negative uh, and was just doing his job and that was it, right? I, in my time, I didn't see that employee despite two managers who were trying their best go back to the full health zone. But that is a real example of what I noticed in in, in Bob, right? I don't know if that helps, uh, Ruthann. 
It does, and I thank you. I, I, I just wanted people to, to understand that sometimes the clarity of hindsight um, can give us the foresight to see, you know, your example of having seen one employee kind of go through that that spectrum allows people to sort of say, okay, I'm starting to see small changes and that's where the interventions can happen and should happen. And um, I'll tell you, are, and if I can add to this, Ruthann, yeah. so we manage a, a large uh, clinical program. So it's a peer support program for the healthcare system in Nova Scotia, where our peer supporters go inside the hospitals every day and they support patients with doctors, right? And our manager there and I, have meetings regularly uh, and uh, we now talk about employees sometimes or we're wondering where is this employee on the spectrum we use this model to understand where the person is as a framework why because we're trying to support them and what you do to support an employee is different from reacting to injured to ill right and so we don't talk behind their backs we are trying to really understand where they fit in the spectrum so that she and I so Lauren and I can actually figure out how we best support the person and so yes hindsight is always 2020 but you can start having a, a much better vision for the future when you look at employees through this lens and you actually work solutions out through this lens as well I appreciate that. You brought to mind a very uh, common old saying, the mind is a dangerous place. Don't ever go in there alone. So, you know, always bring somebody with you. So I want to thank you, Stefan, for the hour that you have spent with us. It's just flown by. I appreciate that. If you want to just put that back slide on again so that people can know uh, your company and the contact information and uh, can reach out. This recording will be available on the Tech Canada website under COVID-19 Insights. Just click on the drop-down tab. The webinar will be there. I will have uh, Stefan's slides uh, uh, put together on a PDF so that you can refer back to some of these um, programs in the spectrum that we've just discussed. And again, thank you, Steph. I see the lights are on, uh, looking good at your place there. <laughs> and uh, to everyone, thank you for joining us today. Be well.